Okay, I think what I'm going to do is cover chapters 39, 40, and 41 roughly in about 20 minute chunks. Is that a deal? So it's a lot of material. How about if I just go ahead and start with Genesis chapter 39? Ready? Okay, I'm reading out of this translation. As you know, you can bring your own Bibles, but the ESV is what we use here. So if you bring your own, just be aware that the language may be a little different than what you've got in front of you. So, chapter 39. Now, Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had brought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight, and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house, and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all the things that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that Pharaoh had in, the in his house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Hmm. Now Joseph was a handsome in form and appearance, and after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, uh, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And she spoke to Joseph day after day. He would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. But one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were in the house, she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has, brought, um, see, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came into me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that, I lifted up my voice and cried out. He left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her side until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. And whatever had been done, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. So, one of the things I've told you repeatedly in scripture is it is very earthy. <laughs> and, uh, and as I said before, Scripture, the Bible, is actually unique if you look at the history of human religions and just holy books in general. Most times, most other world religions, in fact all of them, tend to cast the, the characters in the story as these great big moral heroes. Is that true of the Bible? No. Uh, Joseph, yes, but there's all sorts of really, oh, read the Tamar story in chapter 38, you'll get an example of what I mean. You, what you see in, this, in the Bible are people who are confronted with the same sorts of issues that you and I are confronted with every single day. The first thing I want to show you about this text is Joseph goes to Pharaoh, and if you notice what happens is in the very beginning here, it says in, ver in chapter 2, it says that Joseph is successful, and it says why. Verse 2, look at it. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. Something important, which you actually will see through the entire Old Testament narrative, is right there in that one verse. 
God, does God choose the most important people in the world? Is, is, well, actually, even back up a step. Who is the oldest brother of the 12? Anybody remember from last week? Reuben. Reuben. Good sandwich, but not a very good brother. <laughs> and Reuben was the oldest one who should have been the one who was the responsible one, but he wasn't. Joseph actually, interestingly, who I think is the seventh out of the 12, he's the one who consistently demonstrates something very, very important, which is moral decisiveness, which we'll see in a second, and also that God is with him. Notice something important, and again, it's a repeating thread through the, through the Joseph story, certainly, and even through the Old Testament, that when you see people that are successful, it's not because they are great uh, actors and great charismatic leaders, it's because, verse two, the Lord was with him. And if you notice, as you're going through the story, Pharaoh, as we, get, as we proceed through this, Pharaoh actually begins to see in Joseph that there's something unique about him, and that actually the Lord, Pharaoh, begins to acknowledge that the Lord is with Joseph. That's important, and here's why. Anybody know anything about ancient Near Eastern Egyptian religion? Is Pharaoh a king? God. Yes, he is. He is a king. He's a, it's a theocracy in one sense of the word. So Pharaoh is not only a king, he also believes himself to be a god. And so what we're going to see in a moment is Pharaoh beginning to fall under the influence because of Joseph's example to see that God, the real one, is actually with Joseph. It's, pretty fa it's very subtle, and as, a, and as a, first, a 21st century Westerner reading the text, you'd probably miss that. But the subtext here, given the context of the time, is that Pharaoh is a god who is beginning to realize he ain't no god at all. But there's a real god, and this guy Joseph has got it. You with me? So, um, it's an, a, a, I, I'm trying to teach you, obviously we're not doing a very deep dive in the text here, we don't have the time, but I'm trying to show you themes that repeat themselves so you can read scripture on your own and it will make sense to you. Joseph goes into Pharaoh's house and immediately he begins, what does Pharaoh do? Does Pharaoh kick the tires? What does he do? Verse 4, so Joseph found favor in his sight. Do you, now why does Joseph, why does Joseph find favor in Pharaoh's sight. How come? He's successful at what he does. And why is he, why is he successful because of what he does? Because the Lord is with him. So there's an, an undercurrent of all of this. And in fact, you're going to see later when Pharaoh asks Joseph to interpret his dream, he says, hey, Joe, you're a big dream interpreter. What do you say about this? And Joseph says, no, 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 you got this wrong. It's not me. It's the Lord. So what you see in the story of Joseph is an emerging sense of what? Humility. Did we see that last time with Joseph? Yes or no? Not so much. Remember Joseph said to his brothers, yeah, you guys are going to all bow down and worship me, which of course he was right. We'll see that later. But was Joseph kind of cocky and naive? Absolutely. But being sold by your brothers for the price of a slave to a bunch of Ishmaelites knocked them down a few pegs, didn't it? And what we're going to begin to see in the story of Joseph is that he is beginning the, the process of being humbled so that God can use him. Okay? How many people here, when, you're, when you are in the... Let's turn it around on us, because the word of God is about us. It's not, about, it's, only, not only historical, it's about us. How many of us, when we are suffering, go, man, this is great. I'm going to learn so much from this. I just can't <laughs> wait. Anybody here? What's that? All of us. Anybody, everybody in this room, you all know when you're suffering that it's, a, it's really for the best and you're going to learn a lot, right? But, but actually, what Scripture says is that suffer, God uses suffering to build character. And what we're going to see in a moment is he's beginning to work on Joseph, not, um, not to get around the suffering, but actually through it. God does his best work when you and I are wrestling against things of this world. Do you know why? We learn something very important when we are suffering. We learn that the things of this world don't deliver, but that God is what? Reliable and trustworthy. One thing, which I say repeatedly in this, in this church, and because it's true, is that religious faith, it does say trustworthy, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. You know how my handwriting is. Is, is, um, is believing in God just, uh, is faith, 
just believing that God exists? No. Yes or no? No. Faith is learning to trust him. Faith is not just an intellectual ascent to a truth claim. I believe God exists. Yeah, great. Everybody does. What faith, what the Bible's faith is talking about is your ability to learn a very important lesson. In fact, the most important lesson for humanity, and that's that God is trustworthy. The only way you learn that God is trustworthy is by doing what? Trust. Trusting him, which requires you to, <laughs> requires you to have trust in something that will get better, even though right now things aren't looking so great. Does that make sense, everyone? So that's why suffering is actually, and, and you'll see it in Joseph, begin, will grow Joseph and you and I, because when we are suffering, in all different ways, we are forced to do one of two things, get angry and bitter, which is what a lot of people do, or hopefully see the big picture that God is trustworthy and that he will deliver us. Amen? Any comments or questions on that? Again, we can dive into all this stuff. Um, let, me let me dial into verse, verse 6. So Pharaoh sees that this Joseph guy has God with him, whatever that means, that Joseph has a charisma or power or something about him makes Joseph stand out. And Pharaoh trusts him. Isn't that interesting? Um, why do you think that is, that Pharaoh trusts him? Because Joseph is, trusts God. Right? It's all this idea of it flowing through him. Now, Joseph was a handsome man in form and appearance. It actually means he was uh, not only physically attractive, but he's built. He's a, he's a, I don't know, I, I know nothing about him, but it's, it's a pretty flattering expression about him. And it says his, his uh, master's wife, this is called euphemism, uh, cast her eyes on Joseph. That means she thought he was smoking. <laughs> she thought he was good looking, and she goes after him. And, and did you notice something really important? And you be, you're beginning to see Joseph being knocked down a few pegs, but also beginning to le really learn some important lessons. When, um, when, Joseph, when, his, when Pharaoh's wife goes to Joseph and, and solicits him, him for, for uh, a bedtime story, he says to her, um, look at verse 8. He is not greater in this house than I am. Uh, no, hang on a second. Verse 8. But he refused, Joseph refused, and said to his master's wife, Behold, remember that word behold means pay attention. Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in this house. And he has put everything that he has in my charge, including you, Potiphar's wife. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept anything back from me except you, because you are his wife. Joseph says that. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? There is a threefold defense in there. Did you notice it? What is he saying? Hey, look, Potiphar's wife, he trusts me. Pharaoh trusts me, and I'm not going to betray that trust. He's counting on me, and I'm not going to let him down, right? And the third thing is, how can I disrespect my God? Isn't that something? By implication, her husband is supposed to be God, and she's willing to disrespect him. Don't miss the subtext there. But notice that Joseph, Joseph is actually, in this very short amount of time, has learned a very valuable lesson, right? And that is, and remember, does he trust his brothers? Was he betrayed by his brothers? No. I mean, yes, he was. So has he been, has he been kicked to the curb several times? Yes, he has. Has he gotten bitter and resentful over it? No, he hasn't. Why not? Because the Lord is with him and because he trusts God. He sees the bigger picture. So when you and I get kicked in the pants by life, and you will, and if you're not now, you will at some point. We all go through this. The key to it is not, the key to it is to remember that God has a plan. Later on at the conclusion of the Joseph story, Joseph comes out and says this to his brothers. You intended this for evil, but God intended it for good. Do you see my point? And just notice something here. Joseph has, despite the way he's been treated by his brothers and the betrayal of them, he has not caved in to bitterness. Why? Because he knows that God has a plan. That'll preach. Yes? Every single one of us goes through this. And I want you to see the Joseph story as an illustration of your heart and of mine. That's why it's here. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so, so his wife, so let's move on here. Um, any comments or questions on that? You guys track with me? Yes, Lynn. Mm -hmm. It's, fair, it's his master, okay, that's a good question. Potiphar is the captain of the guard. The master's wife is Pharaoh's wife. 
Master's wife is Pharaoh's wife. Yeah, this is the big dog that, he's, that his wife, yeah, it's, not, it's pretty unseemly. Yeah, this is Pharaoh's wife. Is it Potiphar's wife? His ma okay, it's Potiphar's wife. So, okay, anyway, yes, either way, the person who is in charge of Joseph, it is his wife. Potiphar is the captain of the guard, who actually is the guy who's also in prison, when, when Joseph gets thrown into prison. So look here, let, let's, let's move on here. Um, as soon as, look at 19, and this is why I'm not sure about this, Lynn. As soon as his master, verse 19, heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. That word there is a Hebrew expression, which means he is furious, as you might expect, right? Um, not only because jo he, he believes that Joseph may have uh, tried to seduce his wife, but he's also betrayed his trust. Anybody here ever been betrayed? It's, yes. It's, yes, it's vicious, and it is the worst thing you can go through. Um, and jo jo Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. This is why I think it's Pharaoh and not Potiphar. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge. So the, keep, the, the keeper of the prison is probably Potiphar, which is why I think that it's Joseph. The, the wife in question here is Pharaoh's. But if somebody can find it in here, I'm happy to be corrected. Which verse? Verse what? Well, at the heading for chapter 39, it says Joseph and Potiphar's wife. No, it does. Okay. Well, we'll move on. Yes, okay. I don't see that. That's in the... If you get the NIV, it's a little clearer. Is it? <laughs> anyway. Uh, and the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. Why is the keeper of the prison, who is, who is uh, Potiphar, actually, which is why I'm confused in this, because uh, anyway, it's moot point. Um, why does the keeper of the prison meet Joseph? He gets, Joseph gets thrown in basically a, 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 a keep where they would keep political prisoners. Why does, why does the keeper of the prison ha find Joseph favorable? It's a really interesting thing. So, so Joseph was in, was in Pharaoh's house, presumably somebody's house. He is entrusted with everything that Pharaoh has. He then gets thrown into prison, and the keeper of the prison goes, you know what, I like this guy. I'm, not, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to not, um, I'm going to treat him well. I'm going to put him in charge. Why does he do it? Why does the, why does, because the Lord is with him. I don't know. It just says it. Well, that's actually a good, a good question. Here's the subtext. When the Pharaoh, or whomever, is, uh, is enraged by this, what would be the penalty for that crime? Death. Death. Treason at the very, you know, he's the king, he can do whatever he wants. He doesn't kill him. He throws him in pr into prison. Why? Well, it's, again, it's speculation, but one of the commentators I was reading through said, well, this may not be the first time something like this ha has happened. Nothing happened to her. What? Nothing happened to her. Well, that's a good question. I mean, who knows? It's all speculation. But the fact of the matter is, Joseph should have been, if, if the story was as credible as it seems, he should have been wacko and right then. But he wasn't. Why? I'll leave that to your imagination. We don't know why. <laughs> there could be lots of reasons why, yeah. So, um, and also, his cook got in trouble for him. His cook gets in trouble and the cupbearer. His cook gets in, in trouble. That's right. He does. So anyway, um, but then again, verse 23, the refrain, and whatever Joseph did, the Lord made it, succeed, made it succeed. Okay, any questions or comments about that? That's interesting about that heading, Jenna. I'm going to look into that because I don't think it ever says Potiphar's wife in that, but we'll worry about that later. Okay, verse 40, or chapter 40. Sometime after this, uh, that is a, just an expression like the next thing. Um, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. 
Okay, this is why. Well. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard is Potiphar, which is why I'm confused by this. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody. And one night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came into them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers, who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, we have had dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. Let me stop there, and we'll dive in for a few things here. You know, in the New Testament, when it says, uh, his countenance fell, the old translations, um, there's a, that idea here, it's a, a biblical idea, which means, and you know this, you walk in and you see somebody, and you can tell something's just not right. So Joseph is not only uh, trustworthy and loyal and willing to go in, joint, uh, go in prison on a false accusation, he's also incredibly, what? Insightful. insightful and intuitive. And not just insightful and intuitive, he actually cares, interestingly. Um, one thing you're going to begin to, another theme running through the entire Joseph story is that his entire life his entire life is based upon, and his entire growth in his ability to be effective is his repeated willingness to serve. He's willing to serve the cupbearer and, um, and the baker. Why? He just does. It's part of his nature. Does that make sense? Again, uh, so many people, when we've been wrong, when we've been hurt, been betrayed, sold down the river, whatever you want to call it, our, is our first insight and willingness to go to somebody and try to help them? Not usually. We're focused on ourselves, right? Joseph is showing us a, a, a positive way to respond to, to um, brokenness in our own lives. People will oftentimes say to me when they're struggling with something, and they're upset, they're angry, they're frustrated, and I'll say, you know a really good way to, to get through this? And they'll say, what? And I'll say, go ask somebody else how they're doing. Seriously, and don't, don't go ask them how they're doing so you can tell them how you're doing. <laughs> go to somebody else and minister to them. There's power in that because the Lord is behind it. Anybody ever do that? Yeah. There's great power in that because it's not about you, it's about them. And the more you can less focus on your own self and focus on somebody else, you're a lot happier and you can deal with a lot more that, that comes at you. It is uh, ever since Genesis chapter 2 in the fall, where does the human heart always want to go? Inward, right? It wants to turn inward and complain and blame, right? Did you notice, incidentally, that Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's wife, or Potiphar's wife, when Joseph, when she flees, she says, that man, that Hebrew who you brought to me, that sound familiar? Remember Genesis chapter 2, when Adam and Eve and the fall, and Adam says to God, that woman who you gave me? You see the point? Human sin always wants to turn in. Right? And brokenness, always wants to, we always want to turn inward on ourselves and prove ourselves and defend ourselves and why me, Lord? That's not the way the scriptures work. The gospel says, no, 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 you got it all wrong. You're, you really want to heal and deal with stuff? Turn your heart outwards. Is that clear, everybody? Yeah. Anybody, if, you, if you've done it before, and many of you have, you know exactly what I mean. God bless you. Okay. Um, okay. Verse 9, so the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms set forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Incidentally, the cupbearer is the guy who is providing food and the baker bread for the Pharaoh, but also they were the guys, like the old beef eaters, that would eat the food from the king in case it was poisoned. So that's also, he's, he has a great deal. The cupbearer and the baker are placed in very high levels of responsibility in the king's court, not just because the king likes good wine, which I'm sure he did, but also it's a matter of self-preservation. So the point I want you to understand here is that these two guys, these two men, this cupbearer and this baker, have been entrusted with the same trust that Joseph had been given. But something went wrong, we don't know what but something was betrayed. Is that clear, everybody? 
So what they're, they're all basically in jail for the same reason, and that is uh, betrayal, or seeming or accusations of it anyway. Then Joseph said to him, this is its interpretation, um, verse 12. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is with, well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house. For it was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, for, excuse me, for I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that should put me into this pit. Okay? When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, Hey, Joe, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is its interpretation. This, the three baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you. Uh-oh, not the answer he wanted. And hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat the flesh from you. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up, lifted up the head of his chief cupbearer and the head of his chief uh, baker among the servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to him. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. There's a lot going on there, actually. So somebody, so the point I want you is the subtext in all this is that there's it's betrayal, right? Joseph is in jail for presumably betrayal, right, because of the, the wife. The, the cupbearer and the baker, we don't know what they did, but whatever they did was serious enough to warrant being thrown in prison. And whatever the investigation concluded, the cupbearer was innocent and the baker was guilty. And so the, guilt, the baker is executed for the crime, and the cupbearer is restored. So what happened? Maybe it was some sort of internal, um, I don't know, uh, coup for the pharaoh. Who knows? We don't know. Um, but the idea here is that all three of these guys are in the same boat, and that is they are under extreme suspicion of the pharaoh. And interestingly, this is why we're wondering about Joseph. Why is Joseph still alive in the first place? Well, that's a good question, because the guilty person of the, of the cupbearer and the baker, uh, he is executed. Are you guys clear on this so far? Uh, so Joseph goes to the cupbearer and, sa and says, here's the dream, and then um, uh, he says, verse 14, only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house. Does that happen? No. Negative. <laughs> Joseph, uh, Joseph uh, the cupbearer, gets out of prison, and he does not go to Pharaoh, but rather uh, delays. Um, let, me, let me turn that around for a second. Anybody here ever have an experience like this, where say you prayed for something, and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, and God actually answers your prayer, and the answer is yes, which is what we always like to hear, right? Uh, how many of us continue to live our lives in a season of extreme gr gratefulness for that act? Anybody? Let me rephrase it. So many of us, when we are given a blessing in our life, we, you know, we look at this cupbearer, because he doesn't tell, tell Pharaoh about Joseph, and say, hey, Pharaoh, you got the wrong guy. Uh, the cupbearer is freed, and he what? He forgets about it. He carries on with his regular life. Has that ever happened to you? And the answer is yes. And me too, God knows. So the point I want you to see here, and it's, it's kind of a, it's a reminder that Joseph is the one who is always ministering to other people, always putting the needs of somebody else ahead of his own needs. And the cupbearer is liberated and freed. Does he go right away to, to help Joseph? Mm -mm. Um, there is an idea in script, the Lord's Prayer. Jesus says, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive others, those who, who, who have sinned against us. Uh, the idea here is this reciprocity idea, that when you've been ministered to, and you all have been in different ways, what, God, what the scripture is telling us is don't forget it. Don't forget it. And we all do, which is the problem, right? We all do forget it. We kind of go on with our regular lives. You know, we pray about something, Lord, please, whatever it might be, and it happens. 
And then we go, oh, great, and we're happy for a day or two, and then we just kind of, we kind of forget about it. It does not become as life-transforming a thing as we said it would be when it happened. I wonder if that cupbearer sitting in prison said, Lord, if you just get me out of here, I'll be so, you know, I'll do anything you want, right, until he gets out, and then, does that resonate with you? Um, what I'm trying to say, again, is everybody in Scripture is a reflection of us. I mean, they're just human beings, like we are, and they all come, they all have the same pastoral baggage that you and I have. And, and I guess the challenge I want to say to you today is when the Lord has answered a prayer for you, and he has, um, don't forget it. Um, and, and let me just comment on that for one second. When you pray, okay, so if God, if you pray to the Lord, anybody ever pray to God and ask him for something? Anybody? I hope so. He told you to all the time. Um, there are only, everybody says, well, I prayed and God didn't answer my prayer. Sure he did. Sure he did. There's three answers to prayer. There's yes, which we say, the Lord has answered my prayer, right? Like the cup bear. The an there's another answer, which is no, <laughs> which frequently when you look back, you think, thank God I didn't get what I asked for. And there's another one which says this, which is, wait, that's the hardest one. Be patient. But see, the point I want you to see is that when we get this answer, we think, yeah, God answered my prayer. But this is also an answer. And this is too, actually. And this one is basically saying, you know what? I got this. Just trust me. Like, Joseph, just trust me. I got it. The cupbearer does not tell Pharaoh about Joseph's dream. Not yet, anyway. Guess how much longer Joseph is in the joint for? Two years. Two years. That's a long time. So Joseph, Joseph, the cupbearer gets the answer, yes, woo -hoo. Joseph gets this answer, right? Be patient. And this is, a hard, this is the hardest of all three. But if you are like Joseph and you trust God because you've seen him work and you're seeing him work in your life, that's not quite as difficult, is it? Do you agree? Am I losing you all? When, you've, when you spend a little time walking with the Lord and seeing how Jesus actually does answer prayer, and he actually does do what he says he will, even when, you're, even when the situation is unclear, we can be like Joseph and trust because we know that God is trustworthy. Let me stop there. Any, any observations or comments? I've been talking a lot today. Adele. One question I have is, okay. why Joseph was so trusting in the Lord, did he even ask the cupbearer? Just a good word in for Why what? I'm sorry. That's a good point. Okay, so Adele's question is why, if Joseph is so trustworthy, trusting, rather, I should say, of, of God, why does he ask the cupbearer in the first place? Well, that's a good question, but um, we don't know, because it doesn't say, I can't tell you for sure. But I will say this, uh, human events in your life and in mine, it's not just, I mean, most times for me, anyway, when God answers prayer, he answers it through pretty mundane things, right? So, I mean, could God have sprang open the gates of the prison and let let Joseph walk out like he did with Paul? Sure he could have. Um, but does Joseph uh, ask the cupbearer to pray for him, essentially is what he's doing? Um, yeah, he does. Maybe, he, maybe Joseph has an intuition that that's how God is going to work. I, that I, I can't tell you why Joseph did that, but I can tell you this, and that is that God uses sometimes supernatural things to answer prayer, sometimes just people and influencing people's decisions. And remember this, too, that an important detail in all this. The big point of the text here is not uh, getting Joseph out of prison. The big point of the text here is changing Pharaoh. Because Joseph is learning to trust God. Pharaoh is, too. We don't see it yet, but we'll see it in a moment. Good question, though. Anything else? Father, are we good on time? We're, we're good? Okay. Any other comments or observations? Anybody have any questions for me? We're going fast today, I'm sorry, but I've got a lot to... A lot to uh, a lot to cover. I've got a great quote here from, uh, from John Calvin. He says here uh, the temptation and being tempted about um, Pharaoh's wife and then being thrown in prison by Joseph, Joseph being thrown in prison and not complaining but rather ministering to other people. John Calvin says, temptation is not a part-time experience of the believer. Holy Joseph, therefore, must have been endowed with the extraordinary power of the Spirit. There's the important part. 
seeing that he stood invincible to the last against all the allurements, this is a great old language, all the allurements of the impious woman. <laughs> Anyhow, good stuff. Oh, Johnny Calvin. All right, um, any other comments or questions about where we are? Anything? Nothing? Yeah, sure. What you got? Okay. That's correct. And so in faith, it, it emphasizes even more the trustworthiness of God in terms of his faith in God by, not, by the fact that you can't really always trust people. Can you trust that? OK, so Lynn's point is uh, you can't always trust people, so we have to learn how to trust God. Is that the idea? Uh -huh. that we, can't, we, you don't, we can't always trust people, so we have to learn how to trust God. Is that what you said? Okay, more or less. I agree, 100%. Is there anybody you can trust in this world 100%? The answer is no. I hate to say it, but it is true. And including, and is there, it's just, it's just true. So I hate to say that, I hate to break that to you if it's true, but it is true. Even, even though, even though, even though uh, you might really want to <laughs> be as most, and you may be trusting so far to somebody who has entrusted you, granted, but, you know, we're all broken, right? Is that, but God is faithful always. And the interesting thing too about all this story, don't miss it, and actually that's what Calvin was driving at. Joseph is not just trustworthy because Joseph's a nice guy. He's trustworthy because the Lord is with him, okay? All right, shall we move on? Are you guys enjoying this? It's a lot of material, I'm sorry. We're going really fast, but. Um, Okay, 40, chapter uh, 41, verse 1. After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. And behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed on the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows. And Pharaoh awoke. Ever have that happen? And he fell asleep and dreamed a second time, and behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin, and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump, full ears, and Pharaoh arose, and behold, it was a dream. So in the morning his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told him his dream, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Um, let me say this real quick. Uh, God uses dreams frequently. Uh, not, not, I'm not saying all the dreams you have are godly, um, but God does use dreams sometimes to, 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 speak, to communicate to us. Um, anybody want to think of why it might be? Why would God use a dream? Can you stop your dreams? No. Mm -mm. A, a really good example of this is another Joseph, Joseph the mother, sorry, Joseph the husband of Mary of Nazareth, right? He is a guy who is, he's a, a, a tectone carpenter or some worker with his hands, and he has just been told by his wife that she is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, okay, sure, right? And what do you think Joseph's state of mind was when he heard that from his wife? Did he believe her, you think? Angry, frustrated, betrayed, all that stuff. All that tumult that you kind of, you know, just the junk that goes with worry. And what am I going to do? God uses dreams frequent. Well, God, uses, God speaks to Joseph in a dream. Why in a dream? Because Joseph is unable to withstand it. You can't refuse a dream, right? Your will, your will is, you are unable to willingly prevent a dream. <laughs> Does that make sense? So God speaks to dreams oftentimes, not because the person is serene and having a good night's sleep, but on the contrary, to get through somebody's will, which is strong. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay. And so, um, and God speaks to people in all different ways, but dreams is sometimes the way it goes. And has anybody ever had a dream that they thought was from God? Okay. Um, how do you know? I'll tell you how you know. Simple. If it's something, if God says something in a dream which counter, which contradicts this book, it's not from God. If God tells you something from the book, from the dream that is in compliance with this, it might very well be. So. so don't test the Lord. Don't test the Lord. Well, you can ask him for clarity, 
But if I've, if I've often find whenever I've had, had a dream or something which I thought was piquing my under, curiosity about something, if you ask the Lord to make it clear, he does every time. It might take a while, but he will. He's a God. God is a God. God is not a God of mystery. He's a God of clarity. The question is, are we going to be patient enough to wait for the answer? <laughs> I've, I, whenever somebody calls me and says, what should I do? I don't know what to do. I'm trying to figure out if I should do this or this or this. If there's no moral question involved, if the Bible's not clear on the course of action, right? Um, you know, it, right? I always say to them, just wait. God is a God of clarity. And when you are supposed to know, you will know. Right? We know that, but when we're in the middle of trying to make a decision, we want fast answers and we forget it. So anyway. Um, okay, so Pharaoh has this dream, and then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember something. <laughs> I remember my offenses today. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in a chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When, he, when we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And, he, and as he interpreted to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office, and the baker was hanged. I wonder if Pharaoh knew that up to this I guess he probably didn't. The cupbearer forgot about it. Oh, wait a minute. Um, I will frequently give you guys this text to think about and pray about. You know what it is probably already. First Peter chapter 3, verse what? Come on, you should know this. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15, which says, always be prepared to offer testimony for the hope that is in you. <clears throat> right? When God has worked on your life, always be ready to speak about it. Oh, oh, be, be clear in your mind what your story is. Think about it. I mean, it's not complicated. And what, the, what St. Peter says is always be ready to share with somebody else how God has helped you. Did the cupbearer do that? No. Well, he did eventually, <laughs> but it took him a while. Then Pharaoh sent, and verse 14, then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself, when Joseph had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. Uh, that word there, um, um, you ever seen pictures of Egyptian kings and stuff? Um, or Egyptian regular people? They always shave, they shave their heads for some reason. I don't know why. But it was part of uh, Egyptian respect for the monarch that you would shave your, I guess probably your whole body, but shave your head certainly and your beard. Whereas for a Jew, you were always had a beard, right? Or at least, yeah. So anyway, uh, Joseph complies with the standards of the day. He, he uh, shaves himself, gets dressed, and goes and, see, uh, and sees Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that you hear a dream and you can interpret it. Look at this. This is classic Joseph. Joseph answered Pharaoh, Joseph said, now look, put yourself in context. Pharaoh says, I heard you can do this for me. And you know what? Maybe if you help me out, help, maybe I'll get you out of the, maybe I'll spring you from prison, Joseph. Can you, have, can you help a brother out? And Joseph, Joseph, who does not put his own needs first. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Isn't that something? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, behold, in my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile, seven, seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed on the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, such as I had never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows, but when they had eaten them, no one would have known they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as in the beginning. Then I woke. I saw in my dream seven ears growing on one stalk, full and good. Seven ears withered thin and blighted by the east wind sprouted after them. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears. And I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Um, these magicians ha appear elsewhere in the Old Testament in Egypt. Anybody know where? Moses. Moses. After the, after the Isra Israelites get to Egypt, which we're going to talk about, God's got to get them back out again. And he doesn't use Joseph, he uses Moses. And when the Moses story, which we'll get to later, God, uh, Pharaoh calls his magicians to work magic, to, to figure why the rivers are turning to blood and to, do, to mimic the things that God is doing. 
It's the same guys here. But here, they are unable to give an answer. Or did God block them? Oh, who knows? I mean, yeah, that's a good question. Um, but yes, it's, or did God block them, or are they just incapable? I don't know. Um, then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. And God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up out of them are seven years, and the seven empty, empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. We're never going to get through all this. It is, I, it is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And, uh, that's what, and so Pharaoh says, great, Joseph, you're hired. I'm just going to talk through the rest of this here. And Joseph begins to rise to power. Um, anybody have any comments on that? Yes. He's a, he, yes, that's exactly right. And that's, a, that's the subtext in all this, and it's actually the subtext later on when, when, when the God of the Hebrews, Yahweh, uh, you know when, when uh, Pharaoh says, I will kill your firstborn sons, and God says, oh yeah, watch this. And, and actually, what, you're, what you have to understand in this story, it's the beginning of the Moses story, which occurs 300 years later, 400 years later. Uh, a, dueling, a duel between gods of the world, erstwhile gods of the world, and the God of the Bible. And so in that little nugget, and, and um, Marilyn picked up on it, um, Joseph answered Pharaoh, verse 16, it is not in me, God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. And Pharaoh said, behold, in my dream. Pharaoh tells him anyway. Isn't that something? It's real right. It's a little, it's a tiny little movement, if you will, of Pharaoh beginning to trust the God of the Hebrews. It's fascinating. God of the Israelites at this point. And so then we find out later on that, uh, that uh, Joseph goes and he is put in charge of all of the, uh, all of the grain in Egypt. He's put in charge and he begins to dispense it. Pharaoh has moved him once again, if you read on through here, and we're gonna, I don't have the time to go through it all, um, but he puts, Pharaoh, he puts Joseph in charge because he believes Joseph's interpretation of the, of the dream. Why? Because God was with him. And he, puts, he restores him to power. Pharaoh restores Joseph to power. Look, um, look, at, look at verse 41, we'll skip down. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, after the, Joseph gives him the interpretation, Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him ride in his second chariot. And they called out before him, Bow the knee. Thus they set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent no one shall lift up hand or foot in the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name something or other, and he gave him in marriage Zephanath Benaiah. So Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. That, that, trend, that word, that Egyptian word, means, I thought this was pretty cool, uh, God, he, uh, the God's, God's the, Joseph's new Hebrew name means God said, let him live. Isn't that something? So by Pharaoh naming Joseph a different name, Pharaoh is beginning to move in his own understanding of who this God of the Hebrews is. He has put, so Joseph, Joseph has actually been restored to power, right, and authority because God was with him, but also because Joseph was willing to serve. Do you see it? You all know, um, you may not know this, maybe you do. Um, Jesus tells us, and we're going to fast forward a little bit, that we are called to Love our enemies. Love lots of people. Love our enemies, love our neighbors, all these things. Uh, that Greek word for, for love is this word in Greek. It is the English anglicized word agape. You've heard that before, right? What is agape? Is it a verb or a noun? It is a verb. 
And the word agape, there are five, seven different, there are seven different words in the Greek New Testament, all translated L-O-V-E. This is one of them, and, it's, and they're all different, but they all get translated the same word, which just makes it confusing for people. So, so when Jesus says, love your enemies, we think, so I gotta like these people? Anybody ever think that? How do I love my enemy if I can't stand? If he's your enemy, think about it like this. If he is, by, if he is your, your enemy, by definition, you don't like him. Is that fair? Can we agree? Yes. Okay. If somebody is your enemy, you by definition don't like them and probably don't want to spend a lot of time with them. You with me? God, Jesus Christ is not saying like people that you don't like. It, that's nonsensical and it's stupid. What he's actually saying is exactly what Joseph's doing. Agape is, means put the needs of someone else ahead of yourself. It's a verb. You and I, friends, can put the needs of somebody you can't stand ahead of yourself, can't you? You can do it. It's a verb. You may do it and not like the person one bit, but you can do it. It's a, it's a behavior. Christian love is not an emotion. Christian love is a behavior. It's a verb. That will, make, that will help you understand this. How could Jesus, unless you're going to engage in sort of just silly religious language, that's not what Jesus is doing. He's saying to you, love those who have wronged you. And in fact, Paul goes on to say that by loving those who have wronged you, you might actually change their hearts, just like Joseph has done. Do you see that? What do you make of that? <laughs> I think it's easy to, uh, to do that in prayer. It is. That's right. But uh, in person, that's a different story. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a good, and again, this is a pastoral matter. If anybody needs help in this regard, come talk to me. I'm happy to talk to you about it. Um, what are some practical steps in all this? Christian, Christians are not called to be doormats. And in fact, what, what the Christian idea of love <laughs> is not to get people to walk all over you. That's not true. The point of Christians loving our enemies is to convert them. Let them see God working in you, just like they did with Joseph. Did you, the reason Joseph changed all these people's hearts is because God was working what? Through him. It says it repeatedly. And you and I are called to do the same thing by being people who God works through. Does that make sense? You can't do it. You can't do it. That's exactly right. Pam nailed it. That's what, and that's what John Calvin said too, right? Without the power of the Holy Spirit in you, strengthening you, you can't do it. When I did it, after I did it, I thought, who is God? Right. Well, it, it was God working through you. Exactly. And actually, yes, you're exactly right. And it's totally counterintuitive and is totally countercultural, but it is the gospel. And I just want you to see in the story of Joseph a little tiny glimmer, if you will, of the gospel, which is, reaches its fulfillment with Jesus Christ, of loving our enemies, but only because God loved us first. Does that make sense? I got three minutes. Any comments or questions? Funny anecdotes? <laughs> you learn, anybody learn anything today? I'm sorry we went so fast. It's a lot of material to cover. Um, anything else? I don't think so. Anybody? Questions or comments? In the Beth Moore studies, he did the study of Joseph. So it's really a lot of the same thing that it's always been here and over. Okay, yeah, Pam's comment, people asked me to repeat the questions for the, for the camera too. Pam's qu comment was in the, in the Beth Moore study, you talked about Joseph. And yeah, we're just, we're just beginning to see Joseph's character, because God's with him, emerge. Later, you see, you, see the, you see the culmination of all this when Joseph actually confronts his brothers who attempted to murder him and have lied to their father and sold them down the river, and sold him down the river. You see Joseph confronting his brothers in love, right? And in so doing, he saves their lives. It's fat. Scripture is so full of irony, because God has got this great sense of humor, I guess, but so full of irony that in, in his brothers trying to kill Joseph, it actually gives Joseph the opportunity to save their lives by working through Pharaoh. 
and feeding them. Fascinating. Anyway, Muggs had something? No? Okay. All right, I gotta go do Stations of the Cross in a minute, but I'm glad you all were here. Any further questions or comments? Uh, okay, uh, by the way, these, are, these uh, lessons are online on the website if you wanna go back and rewatch these. Uh, they're good, good fodder to think about, and uh, we've covered a lot of material, so it might give you a chance to rehear some of the stuff from today. Before we go, uh, shall we close in prayer? The Lord be with you. Lord God, we thank you for uh, your word, which challenges and comforts us. Lord, we thank you for the gift of the faith of your servant, Joseph, who uh, in so many ways prefigures the real saving faith of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for Joseph. We thank you for um, his willingness to trust you, not despite suffering, but in the midst of it, and his willingness to love his enemies, not despite suffering, but in the midst of it. Help us to see that it is only through your indwelling spirit and power that can enable us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.